Hello, and welcome to the final episode of the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg. When I made the first video of this series all the way back in November of 2021, I didn't even really want to make this a series, or in multiple parts. And when I did eventually give in to the idea, I really didn't think people would stick around by the end of it. But since that first episode, these iceberg videos have easily been the most popular videos on my channel. And I seriously can't thank you guys enough for your patience and feedback over this last year and a half that this series has been going. Trust me, I'm under no illusion that this is at all a perfect series, and I fully understand that corrections are in order. And I do plan to do that at some point in the future with a corrected and combined version of this series, but for now, I just wanted to get this final episode out. As I mentioned in the previous one, tier 5 is the final tier, and instead of splitting it into parts, I figured we could end this series off with a bang by covering it all in one go. But before we do that, I have an important announcement to make. Are you an aspiring artist that just absolutely hates their art? You're just looking at your drawing and you're thinking to yourself, man, this fucking sucks. And you're just at a point where your self-esteem is just non-existent at this point. You're just looking at your drawing and you're like, you, you just hate everything. You hate your drawing. You hate yourself. Well, do I have the product for you? Introducing the Killful Dinosaur shirt. That's right, boys. I finally sold out. I'm selling merch now. The design on the shirt is based off of childhood drawings I made way back in the day when I was like eight that I showcased in a, in a video a little while back that people for whatever reason, they just, they just loved it. And uh, I just thought, you know what? If I'm going to show my cringe on the internet, the least I can do is monetize it. So yeah, I've made a shirt out of it. This is the Killful Dinosaur shirt. You have all of these amazing things on it. You have the, uh, my favorite dinosaur, Brachiosaurus. You have a little pterosaur up here in the corner. You have the very killful Pachycephalosaurus. Obviously, killful is the, uh, the trademarked word that I, uh, I, I invented myself when I was eight. Obviously, I was just a child prodigy. What can I say? And of course, you have, um, um, whatever this thing is. But you know what? Maybe shirts are not your thing. Maybe you're more into, uh, I don't know, long sleeve or maybe a crew neck or a hoodie even. Well, you're in luck because you can find all of that in an array of colors at this link that will be at the top of the description below. I'm really happy with how this turned out. I was really nervous that it wouldn't work out, but it ended up coming out really nice. It feels very high quality. I think you guys are really gonna like it. Buy the shirt. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna waste any more time. Let's get back to the video. So without further ado, let's take a look at the weirdest theories, hypotheses, and concepts regarding prehistoric sciences. Let's take a look at what's at the bottom of the iceberg. Cometary Earth Theory in 1696, English theologian William Whiston would get his book published titled A New Theory of the Earth, where he wrote that the historical events played out in the Bible, like the global flood, the plague of Egypt, the stories of creation, could all be tied down to a more scientific explanation. That being said, from the sounds of it, Whiston's ideas were to mainly meet in the middle of both natural philosophy and religious beliefs. He wasn't trying to necessarily discredit the accounts from the Bible, as from what I've read, he didn't seem to give any inclination that he thinks they didn't happen. He simply submits the idea that they were caused through more natural means, to counter-argue the literal interpretations of the Bible that left little to no room for natural reasoning. And his theory was that these historical events in Earth's history that are recounted in the Bible were caused by comets. The idea of what comets were had changed within the last hundred or so years prior to the publishing of Whiston's book, with the main change coming from a theory that Isaac Newton developed himself. Part of Newton's theory was that comets were crucial for the stability of the universe, believing that comets that flew past celestial bodies like the sun or other stars or planets even had replenished them by essentially refueling them as it passed by. He also believed that the orbit of the comets were caused by divine intervention. One source I saw even mentioned angels, which some seem to have interpreted as extraterrestrials, but I digress. This idea would resonate with Whiston long enough for him to want to expand on it. So he would continue this theory by going one step further to say that Earth even started out as a comet that he too believed was being orbited by some kind of divine power. 
and that Earth formed based on this idea. This comet would be the very early stages of Earth's core before enough buildup formed it into this large celestial body that Whiston emphasizes was partly supported by divine powers. He would continue to say that after Earth was fully formed, another comet would be sent to graze the Earth's atmosphere that would release vaporized matter, which in turn would cause the endless rains that would lead to the global floods depicted in the Book of Genesis. This flood would alter the overall form of the Earth, and the extra weight would give Earth the gravitational mass that would also change its orbit to how we know it today. The days of the years, the seasons, the rotations, everything about the natural functions of Earth was caused by this domino effect of environmental changes caused by a comet that was believed to have been sent by a divine power. And if I'm correct, this idea would actually lead to some of the other space theories and or hypotheses that I've already mentioned in this iceberg chart, like the Shiva hypothesis and Nibiru killing off the dinosaurs. Fully Aquatic Pterosaurs there was a point in time where the wings of pterosaurs weren't actually thought of as wings at all, but actually flippers that were meant for swimming. This was actually an idea that resulted from one of the very first observations and speculation made to a pterosaur all the way back in 1784 by Italian historian and keeper of the Mannheim Natural History Cabinet, Cosimo Alessandro Collini. The pterosaur he was looking at specifically was a pterodactylus found in the Upper Jurassic Plattenkalk deposits of southern Germany. His idea would be further supported and expanded on by Johann George Wagler, a German herpetologist and ornithologist that would interpret the fossilized remains as belonging to that of a fully aquatic animal. It even got to a point where Wagler placed the pterosaur in an outdated group of animals called the Griffi, which contained other prehistoric aquatic organisms like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs along with monotremes like platypuses. At the time, this group of animals were considered to be transitional species between birds and mammals. Apparently, he would even imply the possible ancestral connection between the pterosaur and modern dolphins by comparing their heads, which at first glance do kind of sort of look similar. But obviously, this idea didn't hold up. It's an outdated view of pterosaurs, and it would be around the early 1800s when another German scientist, Johann Hermann, would take a look at the skeleton and agree that the bone fragments of the animal's fingers supported some flesh, but not for paddles made for swimming. He believed the flesh that would be supported by the bones was a thinner membrane that would form a wing that would aid in flight, which would be one of the earliest speculations of flying pterosaurs. Scrotum Humanum who could possibly forget the classic tale of Scrotum Humanum? In case you forgot, this story starts all the way back in the late 1600s, where chemistry professor and English naturalist Robert Plot would make a very interesting discovery in a limestone quarry that he would jot down in his project studying and documenting the natural history of Oxfordshire, England. He would record all of this in a book that he was probably best known for that was titled The Natural History of Oxfordshire, which was published in 1677. Among his several illustrations, he would also make this one of a very interesting looking bone, which is a now described femur bone of a prehistoric theropod dinosaur, Megalosaurus. But initially, it was thought to have belonged to a Roman war elephant, then later thought to have belonged to a giant from biblical tales. But one thing that he also took note of was its close resemblance to that of male genitalia. That being said, he gave no real name or label to the fossil, but later classifications of this specimen had a bit more of a humorous description for it. Solely meant to poke fun at the look of the fossil, or more likely in this case, Plot's illustration of the fossil. The first label of this fossil would show up in English physician Robert Brooks 1763 book, A System of Natural Natural history, where he would give it the now infamous name Scrotum Humanum. Despite being what was most likely just a jokey name given to this find for the shits and giggles, Brooks actually went through the normal naming procedures for scientific finds like these to give it its name, using the Linnaean system to give it a binomial nomenclature, or in other words, made it so that this find could have that formal two-word Latin name that's typically given to organisms. 
But there's more to this beyond the name itself that makes this discovery weird. For example, at this point, it's widely considered this fossil is the first dinosaur fossil to be given a proper classification in history. Meaning, the first dinosaur classification was referencing testicles, which is just very funny to me. But second off, because this formal naming system was used, and even more effective because it was published, Scrotum humanum apparently had priority over Megalosaurus even if it was meant to be just a funny joke name. But after many debates about it, it was eventually realized that this name was not meant to be for taxonomical purposes. So it's now kind of just known as the unofficial funny name given to a dinosaur fossil. Also, as far as the original fossil goes now, unfortunately, it's been lost to time. And while many are almost certain it belongs to Megalosaurus given where it was discovered and the descriptions that were given in Plot's original book, it's not 100% certain. But honestly, who cares? We have Scrotum Humanum instead, that's all we need. Suminia Civilizations Suminia is a late Permian synapsid that's considered one of the earliest animals to develop the abilities for arboreality, meaning it had certain abilities that allowed it to live its life among the trees. These different features, including its skeletal proportions and prehensile abilities like its grasping hands, lead some to consider it to have a close resemblance to basal primates. And in turn, that leads others to take that thought and continue it down a theoretical rabbit hole, ultimately bringing back the idea of a prehistoric civilization existing prior to human civilization, this time in the form of humanoid Seminias. One example that I was able to find of this idea being expressed was on this site called Agile Libre, with this specific page being titled Don't Quote Me On This, written by Oyvind Hammer. Basically, in this short article, Hammer explains the hypothetical scenario that posits the idea of how much a trace modern human life would leave if we were to suddenly disappear. And he does this by referencing books like The World Without Us and The Earth After Us, which both give arguments that within a short span of time after our disappearance, there would be little to no trace of us left. In The World Without Us, it speculated there would be very little evidence of our existence only a few centuries after our hypothetical disappearance. In The Earth After Us, we're given a hundred million years. The whole point of this argument is to support the idea of a pre-existing civilization before humans. Because if it's speculated that it would only take anywhere from between a few hundred centuries to a hundred million years after our own disappearance, before any direct evidence of us becomes essentially non-existent, what's stopping us from believing the idea that there could have been a pre-existing and now extinct civilization brought up from prehistoric life in the several billions of years Earth has been around. Instead of searching for alien civilizations in outer space, we might have better chances searching for them on Earth back in time, where we demonstrably had ecosystems to support them. Where should we look? In ancient hydrocarbon reservoirs perhaps where their mighty drilling equipment could have fossilized. Or even better perhaps on the moon and Mars where their scientific landers might have remained unscathed through millions of years. Further down he continues to say, to claim that we are the only intelligent species through time has the same philosophical status as claiming that we are the only intelligent species in the universe. It's unscientific. And in the final paragraph, he finally brings up the late Permian synapsid, Suminia, and how it has some striking resemblance to the Middle Eocene primate, Darwinius. According to Hammer, you give 50 million years to Darwinius, they turn into humans. So if you give Suminia 50 million years, who's to say they wouldn't turn into something similar? And it should be noted that Hammer is presenting this as nothing more than a hypothetical. In the beginning of this article, he literally says, I will give you some straightforward facts and observations, then I will draw a conclusion that is utterly unreasonable and probably untrue. It's just an interesting thought to think about, and he caps it off by saying that if there was a civilization brought up by Suminia, then they could have plenty of time to evolve, thrive, eventually become extinct, and have every trace of their existence naturally wiped clean from Earth. Declassified Prehistoric Remote Viewing Documents 
All right, so if you thought all of the things prior to this episode were weird, wait till you hear about this entry. It gets, it gets even more weird. So basically, back in 1984, there were apparently a series of experiments being ran by the CIA that involved attempting to tap into the deep past from other planets, more specifically Mars, through means of remote viewing by a psychic. In one documented experiment from May 22nd of 1984, a remote viewer, simply referred to as subject in the transcript, was given an envelope before the experiment by the interviewer. However, the envelope remained remained closed the entire time and wasn't open until after the experiment was completed. Allegedly, the subject didn't know what information was written in the envelope but was told any way to follow what was listed inside. The only information inside the envelope read, The Planet Mars, Time of Interest, Approximately 1 Million Years BC. The interview begins with the interviewer telling the subject to follow a specific set of coordinates. There, the subject reports seeing a strange okra-colored pyramid-like structure on a large depressed area. The interviewer then tells the subject to move closer to the time period stated inside the envelope and to report their raw perception of the time and place. The subject struggles a bit to put it all together but states there's a lot of storms which seems to be the result of a major geological problem. They're told to go back in time before that problem occurred where they then begin to see what sounds like constantly changing landscape before eventually seeing very large walls of what could possibly be another structure. The subject keeps an eye out for any other kind of activity before seeing what they describe as a perception of a shadow of people, who are described to be very tall and thin and only a shadow. It's as if they were there and they're not, not there anymore, the subject says. The interviewer then tells the subject to go back in time when the shadow people were present. The subject then sees the thin and tall people in the flesh wearing strange clothing. The subject is then then told to go to various coordinates and locations where they see even more large structures that lack intricacies and are comparable to that of rabbit warrens. They move to a different location where they see a strange road with some kind of marker by it and a bellisk of some kind with an overlay of the Washington Monument popping up randomly. They move to another location, this time some kind of very large and circular basin. The interviewer continues to have the subject move from coordinate to coordinate where they keep seeing strange shapes and roads, eventually losing focus on the image. The subject regains their focus and are told to go to another location where they find another structure. At this point, they're given the freedom to explore, where they conclude the structure is some sort of shelter protecting the inhabitants from the deadly storms. Going inside the shelter, the subject is able to communicate with one of the strange people. They describe them as ancient people wearing what looks like light silk clothing made to fit. The subject asks them a series of questions at the request of the interviewer. Of what they end up finding out, the ancient people are a dying race, as they are unable to find a way to survive in their deadly, storm-heavy world and corrupted environment. Despite this, they're waiting for an answer from a group of theirs that went out earlier by boat seemingly to try and find a new place for their kind to live. They've yet to return. The interviewer then has the subject ask the ancient individual if they know who they're talking to. It seems the ancient individual perceives the subject as a hallucination. And finally, the subject is told to follow the group of ancient people that left on their journey to seek a new home. Where the subject reveals the location this group is at is a crazy eruptive place with volcanoes, gas pockets, and strange but plentiful vegetation resembling something close to a prehistoric landscape of some kind. Finally, the subject is brought out of the experiment and the transcript ends. While I don't really have much to say about this except for the fact that even though it says on the top of the pages that this document has been approved for release back in 2008, if you don't hear from me in a while it means the CIA found me. The Actuarial Problem of Paleontology so according to the description on the Google document of this iceberg chart, which probably has the clearest and most definitive explanation of this entry, the actuarial problem of paleontology refers to the statistical proposal that the sheer abundance of fossil species that have been discovered shows that even if evolution didn't exist or didn't actually happen, that there would have to be a transitional fossil species based simply on probability. Ideas like this were essentially 
actually made to support statistical and empirical analysis in science and how using them is a reliable way to verify certain theories. This went against opposing ideas like Karl Popper's falsification theory that would challenge the idea that scientific theories are determined by verifiability, which in turn determined what theories were considered scientific and non-scientific. His theory suggested that that specific process could have falsifiers in it. Therefore, these theories and claims could come out later as false. So instead of trying to figure out whether a theory is scientific by trying to verify it, scientists should try to determine a scientific theory by proving it wrong. One example I was able to find on the internet about this is that the claim that all swans are white can be proven false by viewing a black swan. But trying to apply evolution to this doesn't seem to work, because like I said earlier, even if you can falsify the theory of evolution, the statistical analysis is still there, which doesn't say the same thing. At least that's how I'm interpreting all of this. It's possible that I maybe missed something and maybe I got something wrong. I know a lot of people don't like it when I try to <laughs> explain things that, you know, I, I don't know completely about, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Admittedly, there's a lot to it, and I'm sure people will gladly help in the comments down below, but for the sake of brevity, I'll leave it here. Spinoferris is an accurate reconstruction. We've done it guys, we've reached so low on the iceberg, we've achieved Spinoferis levels of crazy. I can finally die happy now. Okay, all memes aside, I did recently talk about the backstory of Spinoferis, so I'm not going to go too in depth with its origins here, but to summarize, the Spinoferis is a meme version of the Spinosaurus, and its creation was a culmination of Spinosaurus reconstructions, strange dinosaur hypotheses, speculative evolution projects, and internet toxicity. It would end up being created on April 6th or 7th of 2013 by a deviant art user who went by the name of Yolt, but is also known as Adrian Wimmer. This strange but hilarious depiction of Spinosaurus features an aquatic-based animal with flippers, a hump, and a trunk, giving off a look akin to that of an elephant seal, only, you know, more cursed. The design was meant to poke fun at the ever-changing reconstruction of the Spinosaurus dinosaur, which has had a pretty rocky history with how scientists have perceived it, with many studies and changes still being made to it to this day. Basically, this is a somewhat jokey entry that's making fun of the fact that Spinosaurus's scientifically accurate look had been altered to a point where certain qualities of it start to match up with certain qualities of the Spinoferris. For example, the fact that these dinosaurs were a Aquatic. Now hold on a minute there, dear viewer. I know you were about to go down in the comments section to write about how an aquatic Spinosaurus may actually be an outdated idea due to some recent studies saying their overall size and weight may have prevented this dinosaur from having such an ability. And to that I say I fully acknowledge that, meaning this entry title is outdated, which basically means the whole iceberg is fucking ruined. It's garbage. Throw the whole thing out, nuke the videos, who cares? But this entry is also making reference to the fact that some people in the past have thought the Spinoferis to be an actual reconstruction of Spinosaurus, which I just find extremely hilarious. Humanoid Chirotherium in 1833, in a small town in Germany, a local school principal, Frederick Sickler, would discover a set of fossilized tracks that, at first glance, look eerily similar to that of large human hands. The following year, he would write a letter to Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, a German naturalist, about this find, which would eventually make its rounds throughout the scientific community. Soon, as a result of all these people knowing about the find, there would be an influx of theories and suggestions about what could have made the tracks. One person guessed it was some kind of giant toad while others made more outlandish guesses like the track belonging to some kind of marsupial or giant ape, maybe a bear. What makes these guesses outlandish is because the tracks were found in sediments that were dated back to the Triassic period. But what was even stranger than all of these previous suggestions was the very brief but still crazy idea that the tracks could have belonged to some kind of amphibian precursor to humans. At this point, the only thing about 
about this mysterious animal that made these tracks that naturalists had to work with were the tracks themselves. No other remains of the animal had surfaced, so with nothing substantial, the mystery animal that made these tracks would finally get a name from German naturalist Johann Kaup, that being Chirotherium, which means hand beast in Greek. This mystery would only get weirder as more and more of these handprint-like tracks would turn up in England, France, and Spain, yet no other fossil remains popped up. During the 1840s, other scientists, Sir Richard Owens and Sir Charles Lyell, would give their thoughts and ideas on the strange footprints and would come to the conclusion that they were possibly made by large amphibian animals called labyrinthodons, which also lived during that time period. Things only got weirder for these fossil footprints because sometime later in the early 1850s, Lyell would point out a strange feature in the footprints that being the quote-unquote thumbs of the tracks were positioned on the outside of the foot when it walked instead of the inside. Eventually, he would speculate the animal would walk with its feet crossed, which wasn't very well considered even at that point, but these observations would stay this way until 1925 when a German paleontologist, Wolfgang Sergel, would examine the footprints and come to the conclusion that the thumb of the footprint was not a thumb at all, but simply just a fifth toe from five-toed hind legs. It seems that people back then were so hung up on the close resemblance the footprints had to human hands that their minds immediately suspected it to be exactly that. And in turn, they came up with uh, some, some very interesting ideas that apparently included a frog-like animal ancestor to modern humans. But that still leaves one more question. What did the Chirotherium look like? Well, that was a question that scientists would be asking themselves for decades before it was finally answered. There's a whole history on the Chirotherium's discovery, but to summarize, scientists throughout the decades would make certain parallels between Chirotherium's footprints with footprints of new ancestral crocodilian animals that belong to a group called Pseudosuchians. Some of these specific animals that were compared to the Chirotherium in footprint, size, and point in time include included Prestosuchus, Ticinosuchus, Arizonasaurus, and Tenosauriscus. It wouldn't be until more recently in the early to mid-2000s when scientists finally pieced together that Chirotherium footprints didn't actually belong to one specific animal, but rather they were made collectively by these early crocodile-like reptiles. Fossils vis plastica this entry is similar to that of fossils that are ludus notore, basically meaning the belief that fossils are the result of some kind of force that shapes rocks or other natural sedimentary materials to look like plants and animals, which is sometimes interpreted as jokes or pranks being done on humanity by mischievous spirits. Others believe the fossils were the result of Earth itself, as these people believed in the idea that Earth itself possessed a sentient soul that manipulated certain parts of itself. But in other cases, it's able to create materials, which is where fossils come in, because in these cases, it's thought that Earth itself created fossils from its own conscious contents of what's described in its geological womb. Siberian Karatosaurus Right off the bat, because I feel like some people might point this out, but this isn't referring to the Partridge Creek Monster. As the name intends, the Partridge Creek Monster specifically was reported to be sighted in Yukon, Canada. But this Siberian version of it, the Karatosaurus, which is just another way of saying Ceratosaurus, I guess, is of a different region. Although according to the source that I'm using for this segment, the Karatosaurus is heavily associated with the Partridge Creek Monster, which sort of makes sense considering the two are ceratosaur or ceratosaur-like animals. But on December 17th of 1922, the New York Herald newspaper would print a story revolving a very strange dinosaur sighting made in Kamchatka. According to this newspaper, reports for Soviet newspapers had stated that various sightings of these creatures in packs had been made and that in one case, there was even a photograph making its rounds around the papers showing the foot of a young, dead, and mangled Karatosaurus showing that despite the young age of the dinosaur, its claws could still grip and close down on a human head, along with a drawing made of it based on the reports that have been made about it, which suggests that it is a very large creature with the bulk of five elephants. The paper also mentions the Partridge Creek Monster and its connection to the Karatosaurus, literally calling it the Karatosaurus of the Arctic Circle. 
It goes on to tell a story of a group of men who encounter the Partridge Creek monster and their attempts to hunt it down for proof by taking snapshots of it for some quick cash. On their initial encounter with the dinosaur, they said, It passed like a hurricane across the frozen river, smashing immense blocks of broken ice into the air behind it. Its long bristles were covered with hoar frost and its immense red eyes flamed in the twilight. In their second encounter with the creature, one of the men was able to get three shots of it with the last of his film, with one of them being budged. The article then caps things off by continuing talking about the Siberian Karatosaurus and their purpose to the Soviets. The beginning of this final segment reads, And now the Soviets, war's sinister product, having no use personally for their Karatosaurus family, offer it as bait to the averted and reproving West, a new temptation to resume relations. The Period of Far Eastern Mini Creatures Back in the 70s, amateur Japanese paleontologist Chonosuke Akamura had been scoping around a Japanese mountain coming across some very strange finds. According to his reports, he had found fossilized remains of miniature organisms like fish, birds, reptiles, mammalian animals, dinosaurs, and plants among rock that dated back to the Silurian period. Akamura was known for his studies on the microscopic and small side of paleontology, observing and writing about prehistoric invertebrates and algal specimens all across geological history. Based on what I've read through various sources, it basically just describes his job as boring and not very exciting, because he's covering life that is just not very exciting compared to other discoveries that were being made. Of course, that all changed when he wrote up a paper of his newly discovered mini-creatures. And as if that idea wasn't strange enough, other sources say he also found evidence of other mini-creatures, like dragons and even humans, that were performing different activities, for example, dancing and kissing. He would describe the size of these mini-people to be only one three fifth that of modern humans, but that the overall body shape and structure were still the same. After making this find, Akamura was certain that he had discovered the true beginning of vertebrate evolution, believing these apparent fossils to be the evidence of a previous mini-civilization of humans that lived among modern, prehistoric, and fictitious animals before evolving into their modern and larger counterparts millions of years later. Birds Came First Theory Birds Came First theory refers to a different view of dinosaur evolution that has been made a couple of different times in the past. But in one of the more well-known cases, at least that's how it's portrayed in some of my sources, during the early 90s, paleontologist George Olszewski had suggested a hypothesis that early bird-like archosaurs dated back to the Triassic period were the direct ancestors to all dinosaurs, and for that matter, all future archosaurs. These bird-like archosaurs he was referring to two weren't actual birds, but rather arboreal animals that possessed some bird-like qualities to them. Olszewski and his group of Birds Came First followers had a few specific issues with the more accepted view of bird and dinosaur evolution, essentially saying there were inconsistencies with the time period in which these groups supposedly evolved in, the size of these different avian or avian-like organisms, and the wings of said avian or avian-like organisms. According to this article on the Birds Came First theory, the time problem refers to the fact that basal birds, specifically Archaeopteryx, Gids are older than other Paravians. Bird-like Manoraptorans, for example Deinonychosaurs and so on, are younger than basal birds, not older than them as they should be if birds evolved from Deinonychosaur-like ancestors. The fossil record indicates, Olszewski argues, that the large flightless Manoraptorans, Dromaeosaurids and so on, are more likely to be descendants of the little flying bird-like forms, not the other way around. The article also states that this wasn't the first time something like this was brought up, as back in the 80s, another paleontologist named Gregory Paul had already suggested the idea. The size problem argues the idea that the evolutionary history of birds from dinosaurs has issues because of the belief that, in evolution, organisms tended to get bigger rather than smaller. Real quick, I do want to clarify that I did say belief and not commonly accepted fact, because I am aware that that's not how evolution acts. Actually works. So the people behind the BCF theory suggested that these bird ancestors were always small and that all archosaurs evolved from this smaller ancestral group. 
For the wing problem, which refers to the commonly accepted idea that bird wings evolved from limbs that were initially used for hunting. The BCF group argued against this, basically saying it wasn't likely for wings to evolve from the terrestrial setting these theropod dinosaurs were known to be in, but rather it would make more sense if they evolved in an arboreal environment. So with all of these problems in mind, the BCF group came to the conclusion that dinosaurs, and I guess all archosaurs for that matter, Matter, descended from a group of quadrupedal arboreal protobirds, for the lack of a better term, that looked something like this. These creatures were constructed to account for all of the eventual qualities future avian species would evolve to have. Goes Ahead carried a Meganeura to Custer's last stand. Goes Ahead was a Native American crow that took a vision quest in 1870 to the Wolf Mountains of Montana when he was 19. This was a custom that people his age would take as a sort of rite of passage, gain the power of God himself kind of journey. During his vision quest, he would witness something very strange, a bird-like animal that was flying awkwardly towards him. But as it got closer, he realized that what he was looking at was no bird. He described it more as serpent or lizard-like, but he would get a much better look at it after the creature would fall to his feet and perish. One of the strangest things about this animal was the fact that its wings looked like that of dragonfly wings. Seeing it as a power of God and thinking it to be a part of his vision quest, Goes Ahead would take the creature home with him as at this point he had finished his journey. He returned home where he would cover and preserve the animal with beads and put it in his medicine satchel where from this point on he would take everywhere with him. Even six years later, he still had this dead animal with him during his involvement with the Battle of the Little Bighorn of 1876, where he and a few others from his tribe were enlisted as scouts for a group of American soldiers led by Commander George Armstrong Custer. The two groups shared a common enemy, the Lakota tribe, who had banded together with the Dakotas and Cheyennes who had invaded the Crow's land and as a result were threatening their way of life which would lead to an event that would go down in history as Custer's Last Stand. This battle is the reason why Goes Ahead's name is remembered in history, and in turn, the story of his vision quest and the creature he encountered that day would be brought to light. Turns out, this strange encounter would get the attention of science historian Adrian Mayer who would do some extensive research in the hopes of answering the question of what this creature was, to the point where she was able to secure a couple of interviews, one with Goes Ahead's granddaughter, Alma Snell, and another historian, William Boys, who we will get to in a second. According to Snell, her grandfather would return from the battle and shortly after went back up to the Wolf Mountain to carve into a tree the lizard dragonfly creature he found on his vision quest and kept with him all those years. And for many years after that, the carving was left untouched as nobody went out of their way to go look for it until around the early 1970s, when Snell was approached by that historian I mentioned earlier, William Boys. Boys had heard about Goes Ahead and his own involvement with the Battle of the Little Bighorn and wanted to know more about him. Along with everything she would tell boys, Snell would also tell him about her grandfather's carving at Wolf Mountain, to which he would go after to find, and when he did, he took a picture of it with his Polaroid camera. Unfortunately, the image has been lost to time, but a drawing of the carving still exists. And while it's a pretty simple drawing, it's amazing to see that something like this from this story still exists. As far as the carving itself goes, I have no idea if it's still around, but during the interviews, we find out more regarding Goes Ahead's vision quest and some possible theories for what he might have actually seen that day. Upon finding out about this story and doing her research on it, Mare would give her two cents on what may have actually happened, theorizing that Goes Ahead may have just found a fossil of some kind of prehistoric animal as fossils were one of many things that held spiritual significance to the Crow tribe, and that his witnessing of the creature actually flying, falling, and perishing was just a hallucination as a result of not eating or drinking anything for three days, which was a common display of devotion to God during vision quest. 
interests. When she consulted other paleontologists about the story and asked for their input on it, she got an array of answers. Some thought it was possibly a fossilized plant that just looked like dragonfly wings, or maybe it was a fossil of some other prehistoric flyer, like a pterosaur or a bat. Some suggestions even involved dinosaurs. For example, one thought it could have been a dinosaur specimen with its ribs splayed out to look something close to dragonfly wings, I guess. Another suggestion was that it could have been a fossilized dragonfly or griffinfly, something like Meganeura, the very large prehistoric insect that lived during the Carboniferous period. But this idea was taken one step further in a book discussing these events. In this book called Dragons or Dinosaurs by Derek Isaacs, he suggested that the animal that Goza Head saw was an actual, still-living Meganeura griffinfly until, of course, it died at his feet. Of course, the uh, issue with this theory, aside from the, you know, several hundred million year difference between the Carboniferous period and 1870, was the fact that this idea didn't account for the lizard-like description of the original animal. At the end of the day, it's all a huge mystery, and it's likely to stay that way, unfortunately. As the only existing evidence for this creature seems to be this drawing of its carving. The picture of the carving has been lost to time. It's believed the tree the original carving was made on was a victim to one of many forest fires that have taken place on Wolf Mountain, and as far as the creature itself goes, it was tossed into the Little Bighorn River in 1900, after Goes Ahead had been baptized into Christianity. Dinosaurs on the Moon so this entry is referring to the science fiction book series, the Quintaglio Ascension Trilogy. Oh wait, hold on, hold on, I, I have the wrong thing, never mind, sorry, sorry, false alarm. This is referring to the idea that evidence of dinosaurs, to different extents, have been found on the moon. In some more strange cases, like from Weekly World News, they claim NASA had actually taken a picture of a Tyrannosaurus on Mars that's estimated to be three times the size of the one here on Earth. But for some odd reason, the article is titled Dinosaurs Found on Mars, but then they talk about dinosaurs on the moon before mentioning Mars again in the end. I don't know, that one just sounds like a fucking tabloid to me, but whatever. Another instance where this idea was brought up was in a book titled Can You Speak Venusian, which was written by Patrick Moore in 1976, where in one brief segment of this book, he mentions a paper that was published by the Orion Observatory in Santa Monica, California, which showcased possible evidence of dinosaur remains spotted on the moon. It's a very short segment that's accompanied by this image of what the book describes as as a lunar critosaurus, which was a hadrosaurid dinosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous period. The idea of dinosaur fossil remains on the moon is actually a part of a more plausible theory that's been around for years that the asteroid that caused the dinosaur mass extinction launched tons of debris well beyond Earth's atmosphere, with some of that debris, possibly even dinosaur remains, landing on the moon. And, you know, we're not talking about full-on skeletons here. These remains would be very fragmentary. The idea has been thrown around for a while now since the 70s apparently, but it's brought up every now and again. In 2017, science author Peter Brannon wrote a book titled The Ends of the World, where the idea is brought up again and even more recently it would gain resurgence in 2021 as many news and science outlets would discuss it once again. Initial Bipedalism Initial bipedalism suggests that human evolutionary history began with a sea-dwelling worm-like organism called the marine homunculus that had an upright posture that would eventually lead to our modern-day bipedalism. It was first brought up during the early 1900s, and it even has contemporary supporters today. One of these supporters is Francois Dessart, a French-German zoologist and author who had a whole site dedicated to the study of initial bipedalism. On this site, Sar expresses information and his beliefs on things like the aquatic ape hypothesis, how man had always had their upright posture throughout their evolutionary history, how they didn't evolve from an ape-like ancestral predecessor, and so on. So the question now is, how did we evolve then? It doesn't seem like there's a solid answer, but more so a hypothetical, and this site presents that hypothetical in the form of a flat worm-like organism that's described to be 
the headless marine prevertebrate that generated the human line of ascent. Then the site continues to explain the phylogenetic history of this worm creature, which shows that it eventually evolves to have rudimentary limbs and a large, almost inflatable looking skull, which is meant to provide some control of buoyancy for the creature to keep it afloat, along with serving as an explanation for the origins of the human's big brain. Not to mention that the position it's in keeps its posture upright. Then you have the evolution of their arms and legs, which in the position they're in indicates their eventual use for walking upright on land. But out at sea, they were likely used for transportation and ears were developed as breathing orifices for the homunculus. With their high intelligence and ability to move and breathe, its transition to land was practically inevitable. And that's where we apparently came from, at least according to Sar. Very strange idea. It feels like it's coming straight out of a C.M. Kozumin sci-fi story. Fossils are from the future. This idea comes in a couple of different forms. In one form, this could be referring to a phenomenon that I've already discussed earlier on the iceberg, which is out-of-place artifacts, and how there have been several examples of these in the past where certain fossilized tools and or artifacts would apparently be discovered in deposits or areas that date back to a completely different time period and place than that specific artifact. But this specific entry takes that idea and explains it by stating that out-of-place artifacts are examples of time travelers from the future venturing to the past and accidentally leaving their things behind because I guess they're that incompetent. Which results in those things being left behind to the elements where they become fossilized and leave whoever ends up discovering it very, very confused. Of course, these ideas are hard to really give any merit as there have been plenty of times where out-of-place artifacts have been revealed to be hoaxes or fakes. But this other form of the theory is one that I couldn't find on the net, but luckily we have the Google document, which states, The second is based on the reverse chronology theories written on by authors like Terence McKenna. The idea is that reality only seems to behave in consequential cause and effects ways because of the way humans experience time. This temporal bias is mistaken. In fact, time flows backward towards the Big Bang, which is actually in the future. In this model, fossil animals are actually yet to evolve from their modern day ancestors. Von Hartmann Evolutionary Theory Edward von Hartmann was a German philosopher from the mid to late 1800s that devoted a lot of his work on philosophical pessimism. Yeah, he didn't have the happiest outlook on life, and as a result, his idea of evolution was based on much more depressing concepts. Hartman didn't very much agree with Darwin's theory of evolution. In fact, he was one of the first people to criticize him by arguing that evolution requires a vitalism and a heterogeneous generation of new variations within the germ cells of existing forms of life, according to one source. In his most well-known work, a book called Philosophy of the Unconscious, Hartman explains that he believes the evolution of the human unconsciousness is occurring in three stages. The first stage, which is a stage that has long since passed, was the point in time before man, which Hartman calls the unconscious. It's during this point in time where the principle of reason and will inherent all existence. But that principle begins to fall apart after the eventual rise of man, which is where the second stage comes in, the one Hartman says we're currently in. Throughout this stage, in Hartman's eyes, humans' evolutionary history is based on their attempts to escape from misery due to the competition of irrational will and rational mind. But in the process of doing that, humans only end up making themselves more miserable, which is a cycle that Hartman believes will only advance until humans reach a breaking point that results in the third stage which is a mass collective suicide to end not just our own suffering, but the suffering of pretty much the entire universe. Yeah, this dude was just really not letting anything be happy. Piltdown Man and Cardiff Giant Sightings 
In the past, there have been reports of humanoid sightings that apparently have been noted to look similar to that of known hoaxes like the Piltdown Man and the Cardiff Giant. One example of this is apparently a book titled The American Goliath and Other Fantastic Reports of Unknown Giants and Humongous Creatures by Nick Redfern. And just like the name entails, it's pretty much a compilation of reports and sightings of various strange animals from myths and legends. We've already talked about the Piltdown Man here on the iceberg, but not the Cardiff Giant, so to avoid sounding repetitive, I'll just quickly explain what the Cardiff Giant is. Considered to be a famous archaeological hoax, the Cardiff Man was a 10-foot tall humanoid giant that was found mummified by a group of men digging to put in a well on a farm. As these stories usually go, the owner of the farm decided to profit off of this new discovery he found on his land by making it an attraction that he would charge people to see. News about this find would catch the attention of scientists and eventually it was revealed the entire thing was a hoax and by none other than paleontologist Othniel Marsh, who had visited the find when he found out about its existence. It was apparently just a giant made entirely out of stone that was made to look petrified. The story gets kind of funny though. Turns out the owner of the farm who found this stone man, his cousin, whose name is George Hull, had went out of his way to chisel this giant out of stone and bury it on his cousin's farm simply to prove a point to a reverend who wouldn't concede to a biblical debate he and Hull were having earlier on. The debate was whether or not the Bible should be taken seriously, with the reverend of course supporting that idea and even specifically made mention of the passage of the Bible that talked about giants, which is most likely the very thing that gave Hull the idea in the first place. So basically, he buried a stone giant to troll a reverend. And not just the reverend, but pretty much the entire Bible as well and everyone who takes it literally. And the funniest part is, things would only get better for Hull because even though the gig was up, no one seemed to care. They still lined up to pay to see the carving and some businessmen even bought it off of him for several thousand dollars to move it to a place where it can be properly displayed. I know this is completely derailing from what this entry originally was, but I couldn't find too much on it anyways. And this story was just too funny to me to not talk about about. God is a genetically engineered Spinosaurus. Oh boy, I, I actually really like this one. This one's really cool. <laughs> Draconic Chronicler was a somewhat well-known user of the older days of the internet, who would hang around a lot of now obscure forums, writing sites, message boards, pretty much anywhere where they could write out their stories on dragons and promote the idea that the Bible not only references these mythical beasts they love so much, but also that gods, more specifically Yahweh of Hebrew biblical texts, was modified by a higher power to look like something more akin to a dragon. In one 2010 post titled Yahweh the Misunderstood Dragon on a site called StoryWrite.com, Chronicler goes through the parallels between the common qualities seen from dragons in folklore with what's said about Yahweh in the Bible. To make the connection that Yahweh wasn't a true god in the conventional form, but rather in a form that's closer recognized as a dragon and in the position as a watcher or gatekeeper to the one true creator of the universe, which he refers to as El. They go on to explain the possible origins of their dragon-like appearances, saying that it's possible the creator, or El, visited Earth millions of years ago when dinosaurs were still alive, and selected the most dominant species to be modified and changed to look similar to that of dragons, and to be the ones to watch over and protect the human race that would eventually give rise millions of years later. And while Chronicler doesn't give any specifics here as to what creatures El would select, to essentially be his assistants, they do mention that pterosaurs were possibly one of those creatures the creator chose. However, earlier on in 2007, Chronicler would start a discussion in the unexplainedmysteries.com forums that would lead to one of their most infamous debates that would explain a slightly different version of this idea. The discussion would start on September 18th, 2007, where Chronicler would make this hefty post where he proposed that El, or Elohim, 
the true creator of the universe, had created dragon assistants all around the world that everyone else seemed to have mistaken for gods. They go through their long list of reasonings behind this claim, which was met with mixed reactions, and as a result, this sparked a very long debate regarding interpretations from the Bible, explanations for the abundance of dragon depictions in several cultures, and the parallels between those cultural depictions with that of the Bible. Honestly, for a topic as touchy as religion and for it to be occurring during the early days of the internet, I'm surprised it hadn't gotten more heated, but for the first couple of pages at least, the debate was pretty mellow but interesting. At one point on September 21st, a few days after the initial post, one of the commenters following the discussion asks about the size of the Yahweh dragon creature. Chronicler responds with this, Yahweh is probably representative through his importance among other dragons may mean he is large. Larger. The parameters we have are the fact these dragons are large enough to swallow people alive, as several accounts and even some scripture attest. Yet Yahweh must be small enough to comfortably fit in his tabernacle. I think 60 feet is a good estimate, thus comparable to the largest known carnivorous dinosaur, the Spinosaur. Yahweh also uses his massive dragon body to divert the Jordan River. The exact location is mentioned in the Bible, and having visited the vicinity, I would say a 60 foot long therapy pod like Spinosaur, and therefore presumably Yahweh, could divert the river there exactly like the Bible describes, and with no hocus pocus, just tons of dragons. The entry describes the creator as an interdimensional alien that genetically modified Spinosaurs to look like dragons and serve as gods. In the end, it's a very weird idea, but an interesting piece of the older days of the internet. Fossils are Earth's slow attempts at photography. Academic professor W.J.T. Mitchell is an avid follower of semiotics, which is the study of signs and symbols, and has expressed his different thoughts and ideas regarding images and what they truly mean to us and their significance as signs and symbols. At one point in a book that he wrote titled What Do Pictures Want? He mentions that fossils are quote-unquote natural images of the earth in that they are icons that resemble different shapes and forms that can be interpreted as symbolic depending on the values they hold for different cultures. Of all the images we deal with, fossils seem to be the most deeply embedded in non-human natural processes, life, death, and the species death known as extinction. But this entry could also be referring to the helio memory theory, which is the theory that rays of sunlight imprint images onto rocks from memories of things that those rays have already touched. For example, if I'm interpreting this theory right, if those sun rays had once touched down on dinosaurs, they essentially remember those dinosaurs and imprint their images onto rocks in the form of fossils. If that's how the theory is supposed to go, I couldn't even begin to explain how that might be possible, <laughs> but like most of these entries, it's a cool little idea. Dinosaur Extinction Caused by Polar Shift Hell yeah, another dinosaur extinction theory, let's go. Well, maybe theory's not the best word for it, but it refers to the suggestion that the extinction of dinosaurs and really just any kind of large-scale cataclysmic event in Earth's history was possibly caused by reversals in the motions of the Earth's north and south poles. Really, the concept has been explored in many different formats throughout the decades. Some have approached it as a genuine hypothesis, like in Hugh Brown's Cataclysms of the Earth, Others have incorporated it in fictional works like Jules Verne's The Purchase of the North Pole. Some places around the internet even claim the pole shifts were possibly responsible for the fall of Lemuria and Atlantis. And some have supported these polar shift ideas by bringing up polar wandering, which is the rotation of the planet with respect to its axial spin. In regards to polar shifts killing off the dinosaurs, there doesn't seem to be any hard evidence from the fossil records that proves this, so as of right now, now, at most, it seems like just a hypothesis. Fetalization According to Stephen Gould's book, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, from 1977, the theory of fetalization was introduced by German scientist Julius Coleman in 1905, where he suggested humans originated from pygmy ancestors that probably came from juvenile apes that, as the book describes, had lost the ancestral tendency to regress during ontogeny to lower levels of cephalization. In other words, this group of apes that the pygmy 
Tommies originated from were a group that were essentially at a point in their development when they were the most qualified for human ancestry and the pygmies they would eventually evolve into would retain a lot of their juvenile qualities, essentially being stuck in this quote-unquote fetal state. The theory was further expanded on by Dutch anatomist Louis Bolk throughout the early 1900s, where he presented lots of data and observations through a series of papers that went in-depth with this fetalization theory being applied to human evolution and the connection between the two concepts. He would look at the similarities in bone structure and function, bodily growth and age, and much more. Typostrophism Okay, so this was one that was a bit confusing to me, but from my understanding, there was a German paleontologist named Otto Schindelwolf that had this modified version of Bulk's theory of fetalization, according to the Google document, which is called typostrophism, that he used for his own concept called proterogenesis, which is when species from its fetal to fully developed stages of life develops as if it was an individual organism. I had trouble kind of putting this together in a way that makes sense, but I think the document does a better job, so I'll just let it do the talking. His theory of typostrophism further claimed that all macroevolution was internally directed through this life cycle process and that new types occurred in sudden leaps, where all the traits of a new type of animal would emerge in fetal version of an original mutant individual of a pre-existing type such as a bird born of lizard egg. Traits which would then not evolve further, but be simply reorganized through subsequent speciation. Sacral Skull 18th century philosopher and naturalist Lorenz Oaken theorized the skull and sacral bones were originally fused together at a central point of the vertebral column of the spine which, over time, they would grow to separate and essentially become extensions of the spine. This idea came to him in fall of 1806 when he was walking through the Harz National Park and ran into a deer skull that he had picked up and studied out of curiosity. After turning the skull around and observing it for a bit, he suddenly came to the realization it is a vertebral column. The discovery would lead to several talks and lectures, it would become pretty well known and highly regarded, and eventually it would catch the attention of some other influential figures of science later on, for example, Richard Owens. Owens took this theory and altered it slightly, suggesting the skull extended from the spinal vertebrates into four cranial bones. The parietal, the occipital, the frontal, and the nasal. The idea would also be introduced into paleontology, with the earliest instance coming from Charles Othniel Marsh, who was studying a Camarasaurus one day and noticed the large dinosaur had an expanded canal in its hip region that provided a large empty cavity that, at the time, Marsh suspected was a place for a second brain. This cavity seemed to be present for a lot of larger dinosaurs like sauropods and stegosaurs, which led to the idea that these dinosaurs were so large their brains couldn't reach all the way to properly function their hindquarters, so a second brain in their hip region was necessary. More contemporary scientists like Matt Weedle or Weddle had expressed that this wouldn't actually be the case for large dinosaurs, because movement is mainly operated by the spinal cord and that the brain is only ever involved in the process of movement during certain points, like for example, when it comes to walking through or around obstacles. Paleolithic Deep State Stanisław Szykalski was a famous Polish artist who began his career in sculpting and painting at a very young age. Considered to be a child prodigy in the art world, Szykalski would start as early as the age of six, whittling a near-perfect figure out of a pencil in school one day. His talent didn't go unnoticed. He would be accepted into the Fine Arts Academy in Krakow, where he would be given several awards for his pieces. His influence in the Polish arts industry would increase. His fame would even reach the controversy 
controversial levels as he made several pieces that criticized the academic and cultural higher-ups of Krakow. He was also back and forth from America to Poland a couple of times throughout his life, but when he came back around 1935, he would have no idea that only four years later, his life's work would be completely destroyed by Nazi forces in 1939, which forced him to flee to America where he would move to California and did smaller skilled art projects and jobs to get by. But his main focus at this point in his life was developing a very strange pseudoscientific theory that would be known as Zermatism. The theory goes that there are two groups of humans living in the world right now. The humans that are quote-unquote normal, for the lack of a better term, and the humans that are descended from an older group of Homo sapiens from the Paleolithic that were forced upon and crossbred by evil Neanderthals, or yetis as Shukolsky describes them in his text. And now these crossbred descendants of Neanderthals are living amongst us in plain sight and continue their inner breeding with quote-unquote normal humans. Humans. If you think that's crazy, trust me, there's so much more to this theory because Shikolsky spent years on it. He made several thousand pages and drawings about it. He has a specific name for the group, which he calls the Yedinsani, or the Sons of the Yeti. His ideas are also meant to explain the origins and shapings of not just humans themselves, but also their culture, language, beliefs, and of course, arts. And this part of his idea is just as crazy. Basically, he claims humans first gave rise on Easter Island after surviving the global flood. They would establish a culture, belief system, and even a universal language called Protong, all of which would essentially be the precursor to all of those modern human aspects we know today. At some point, the world became dry and the humans of Easter Island would be able to travel again where they would settle in a region in Switzerland called Zermatt which is where the Zermatism name comes from. Here, they would establish a new civilization, but they would also meet a new threat, that being an ancient group of savage and brutal yetis or Neanderthals that would invade their villages, kill off their men, and force themselves onto the women. Over the years, they would poison the human bloodlines and continue to do so to this day as the crossbred descendants of the Yetis have placed themselves in positions of higher powers over the several thousands of years humans have been around to continue to have control over them. Essentially, Shukolsky was viewing the Yedinsani as responsible for all of the evil that has taken place throughout human history, depicting them as disgusting ape-like brutes in origin, and depicting them more recently as evil contemporary world leaders, which in turn would make them responsible for wars, conflicts, the creation of dangerous ideologies, and so much more. It should be noted that Shikolsky did have signs of mental illness, and I can't imagine that coupled with the fact that he lost his life's work was any better for this, but it could maybe explain his strange obsession with this idea, which many have interpreted not just as a pseudoscientific theory, but a pseudoscientific theory with racist undertones to it. But his ideas would resonate with others, and as a result, his theory would develop a sort of cult following. Oil made from humans. I couldn't really find anything on this one, but according to what Sustained Disgust has told me and what they wrote on their Google document, this is referring to a very weird and rare conspiracy theory that went by the name of the Hypercarboniferous Theory, which used to make its rounds on 4chan, which posited that governments were making crude oil out of humans through use of advanced technology. Not much on it can be found now, but based on what I've been told, this could be the doings of a future government from a post-Petro world that disposes of those that protest or rebel against their authority by using their time-traveling equipment to transport them to the deep past in the Carboniferous period where those protesters and rebels are killed and deposited in a way to form oil for these future societies to use. Again, mention of this is very rare. The only instance of people talking about it that I saw was an archived 4chan message that Sustained Disgust sent me, which says, the red pill term was hypercarboniferous human remains account for the oil deposits. A word that only appears in iceberg meme maps and in search engines as an epoch 300 million years ago. I don't see how this could ever be tested. Soviet abiogenesis. 
In 1972, Soviet geochemist Dr. N. Chudinov of the Berezniki Potassium Combine located in the Ural Mountains noticed a strange red discoloration in the salt deposits which were made up of altering layers of potassium, magnesium chloride, and sodium. Curious about this phenomenon, Chudinov and his team started dissolving the salt with water, which led to the discovery of what I think was initially thought to be a fossilized colony of algae and worms that were dated to be 250 to 300 million years old. But what makes this find so weird is that the algae and worms began to show signs of life. I'm not really sure what reactions led to this, or what the scientists did to trigger life back into these specimens, but whatever it was, it caused them to move around, grow, and even begin to reproduce. Apparently, this would cause Chudinov and his team to attempt the experiment again in other salt deposits, but whether those experiments worked or not, I have no idea. It seems like there was supposed to be some kind of follow-up to the report, but a follow-up never came, nor did there seem to be any kind of of visual proof of this, so who knows what actually happened out there. Some have speculated this event was a result of some form of a biogenesis or resurrection of an extinct species, or maybe this was a case where the scientists somehow mistaken actual live organisms for fossils and they were alive all along. Or maybe this was all just one giant hoax, who knows. Dinosaur Psychic Warfare in 2012, someone had posted a very interesting incident on a site known as Arrowwood Experience Vault, which is a site that's dedicated for collecting accounts and stories of people's experiences while under the influence of psychoactive plants and chemicals, or like, you know, very strong drugs. One user on the site, fittingly called Deterodactyl, recounts the night they had gone to a friend's house for a party. When asked by one of their friends if they had any good drugs on them, Deterodactyl jokingly pulls out, you guessed it, Detura flowers. Datura, in case you don't know, is a plant typically used as herbal medicine, but is sometimes taken for more extracurricular mind-altering activities, but are also known to be very strong and very dangerous. And when I mean dangerous, I mean there are people out there that are very experienced with drugs that would probably tell you to avoid Datura. That should probably tell you something. And that's why even though Deterodactyl was joking, their friend turns the Datura flowers down and they came to the consensus that maybe Deterodactyl shouldn't be taking them anymore. Also, I'm tired of saying Deterodactyl, so I'm just gonna refer them as Double D. However, Double D looks at their friend and says, last trip before eating the two flowers and washing it down with red wine. From what they could gather after their trip, Double D guesses they were under the influence for over 24 hours, and in that possibly more than 24 hour period, a lot of things end up happening. Double D ends up wandering out into the streets trying to get home while having very strange and even disturbing hallucinations that I won't get too deep into because the majority of them don't have any relevance for what this entry is referring to specifically, but I'll leave the link to the post down in the description below if you want to read it for yourself because if you know anything about the side effects of Datura, you'll know that this is one wild read. But what this entry is specifically referring to is the segment of their trip where Double D learned about how the dinosaurs went extinct. The excerpt reads, It was raining by this point and I noticed that the fallen leaves were set up to display intricate scenes, like a timeline of the universe. This was worth all of the terror and confusion of the trip and I spent a very long time sitting in a puddle learning about the universe. This was worth all of the terror and confusion of the trip and I spent a very long time sitting in a puddle learning about the universe. Apparently, the dinosaurs had psychic battles and were all linked up in some kind of morphic field. This eventually killed them when they became competitive with each other within this field, destroying it from the inside. This was the most amazing hallucination that still inspires me with its intricacy. Even now that I realize there was not in fact a hippie sitting there and carefully arranging the leaves, the feeling of amazement that someone had that inhuman level of patience and attention to detail was so powerful that I still draw on it for our artistic inspiration. As interesting as this hallucination sounds, it only really plays a small role in this entire trip. 
Luckily, Double D was able to safely make it back home and finish out the rest of their trip there. They had one hell of a time recovering from it though, which is how it usually goes for these things. They capped their post off saying there were moments in their trip that made it worthwhile, but at the same time, there were points that were disturbing enough to leave a lasting impact on them for a while after their experience. Yeah, just from what I've heard in the past, Datura is one of those things that you shouldn't fuck around with, even if you feel like you're ready or experienced enough for it. Consider this entry a cautionary tale. Morphic Resonance Theory of Dinosaur Extinction Author and researcher Rupert Sheldrake posited his morphic field theory in that memory was inherent in nature and that all living things have this collective memory of all that came previous to them, no matter how far in the past they may seem. And this concept could explain the repeated aspects of nature because as Sheldrake puts it in his book The Presence of the Past, things are as they are because they were as they were. But then there's the question of extinct animals, like dinosaurs. What about their morphic fields? According to Sheldrake, their morphic fields still exist to some extent, and their very fields could be present right now around us, but they can't be properly conveyed since dinosaurs are no longer around to tune into them. However, Sheldrake also makes a very interesting point, saying, if for any reason, for example a genetic mutation or an unusual environmental stress, any living system could comes into resonance with the fields of an ancestral or extinct type, then these fields could be expressed again and archaic structures could suddenly reappear. Basically, he's saying through means of a certain animal reverting back to their traits of their ancestral forms, those animals could tap into the dinosaur's morphic fields and in turn resurrect them. Cats Evolved from Theropods in October of 1920, a very strange article written by Dr. W. H. Ballou for the Washington Times was released with the headlines of Science Finds the Father of the Cat 15 Million Years Old. This article claimed that Ceratosaurus, a Jurassic theropod, was the distant ancestor to modern cats. Somewhere down its lineage, the Ceratosaurus had evolved into a large, ferocious, and prehistoric cat called Oxyena which would eventually evolve into the house pets we know today. One of the reasons why this connection was made between the two creatures was because of some rather vague similarities between the Oxyena's tail and skull structure with that of the dinosaurs. The Oxyena had, by the way, almost the dinosaur tail, that is, it was large where it joined the body, and his skull was much nearer the reptile than is the cranium of modern cats. Also, by the way, the cat skull is the closest approach to the reptile skull of any of the mammals. The article only gets weirder from here because then the concept of cat fear is introduced, which is a trait that some people seem to have, which gives them the ability to sense when a cat has been around their vicinity, even if they don't outright see the cat. This ability, as the name implies, comes from a human's natural fear of cats, and we're able to distinguish this fear of cats specifically due to them having a distinctive odor or effluvium as as the article describes it, that is suggested to be the possible leftover essence of their dinosaur ancestors. The article also brings up the possibility of genetic memory. Nevertheless, during this time there was inculcated in him a wholesome fear of the big carnivores, as well as the great snakes which he encountered in the trees, and this fear he handed down to his successors, so that when several lines of men and apes radiated from him, fear of the cats and snakes was well established. The article continues to explain the ceratosaur's evolutionary history and how it essentially changed from this larger reptilian theropod dinosaur to the domesticated modern mammalian pets we have today. So hey, if you're a dinosaur lover and you own a cat, you can be happy that you have a, a descendant of a ceratosaurus, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> this article is definitely a very weird read, but I'd recommend it if you find these kinds of interpretations funny or interesting. Stegosaurus could fly. 
It seems that Dr. Balu was on a speed run here in 1920 to see how many weird dinosaur theories they could get out. Because they would also write about this infamous article on the Stegosaurus and how the plates on its back could be used for gliding. The article is titled The Airplane Dinosaur of a Million Years Ago for the Ogden Standard Examiner. In it, he points out the first cases of this theory were met after it was discovered the plates on the Stegosaurus's back were not connected to its spinal column and continues to say they were not bone but of a horny nature, flexible and easily manipulated by the muscles of the great body. So he depicts these plates as movable gliding surfaces that can help alter the direction the stegosaurus flies in, similar to that of a plane. As you'd expect, this article gets weirder because it then introduces the idea that flying stegosauruses could have been the evolutionary precursor to feathered wings, thus leading to the idea that birds could have evolved from stegosauruses. The idea was corroborated by the fact that stegosaurus is classified as an ornithischian, which means bird-hipped due to their pelvic bones having a similar structure to that of birds. Despite being what I'm assuming was supposed to be a serious theory, the idea seems wacky enough to work in a classic science fiction adventure story. Which is good because it does. While the flying stegosaurus theory isn't something that would be considered very serious in the scientific world, it definitely made a place for itself in one of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan books, Tarzan at the Earth's Core from 1929. What's even better is that a comic adaptation was made for this book in the late 60s that featured the flying stegosaurus. So now we have a different visual reference of this majestic creature. Truly, truly amazing, if I do say so myself. Baby Pterodactyls on the Black Market as interesting as this one sounds, unfortunately, it seems the only place that mentions this entry is another iceberg that's more focused on conspiracy theories. Where they found a story as strange as baby pterodactyls on the black market is beyond me. But one guess that was thrown out there as a possible basis for the theory was SCP-346. I don't think I've mentioned SCPs in this series yet, but basically it's a fictional internet-based organization that holds records of a great number of strange creatures that come in all shapes and sizes with varying abilities. One of these creatures is a small, mostly harmless pterosaur-like animal that's no bigger than a bat and is kept in a small cage. According to its SCP lore, the owner of the pet store claims not to know where SCP-346 came from, having purchased a set of eggs off the black market, of which only one, SCP-346, hatched, believing them to be from a rare species of parrots. Some theories suggest that there may be a large colony of creatures similar to SCP-346 somewhere in South America. Considering nothing else about this entry pops up in search engines, I think it's safe to say this is what the initial conspiracy theory iceberg was talking about. Unless, of course, that's what the government wants us to think. Fossils were crafted by lost civilization. There was a point in time during the 1700s when academics would begin to realize that Earth had a distant past. But because the idea was new to them at the time, they didn't quite understand that the ancient past they were thinking of was one without man. Initially, it was thought that humans had been around for as long as Earth has. In one case, a quarry man had shown what were seemingly fossil remains of an ancient fish, bird, and a random tooth, along with a strange modern-looking key artifact found in the same deposits to scientist Robert de Paul de Laminon. It stated the quarryman found these remains in a lake near Paris, but it's likely that he didn't actually know for sure what he found, as people at this point in time didn't have the best knowledge with fossils. So the quarryman had theorized to Laminon that it was possible these remains were crafted by a previous civilization of people that is now lost to time. However, even Laminon felt like this was a reach, noticing the imperfections of the materials, indicating that it was too natural to be man-made, but more recent observations of both the story and illustrations provided made some people, more specifically British historian Martin J.S. Rudwick, assumed these remains were a hoax and the material the quarrymen presented were fakes that he crafted himself. Birds Evolved from Flying Fish 
Pretty self-explanatory, but in the early 90s, there was this Chinese professor named Tao Hai that suggested birds evolved directly from flying fish. His reasoning for this was based on an examination of a fish fossil of some kind from the Xinjiang region that he interpreted as an early bird-like animal with fin-like wings. Re-examinations of this find have shown that this wasn't a fossil of an early bird, but rather a fish, and it was guessed that it could have been an early example of a species of flying fish, but it was even later found out that this fossilized fish was not a flying fish, but rather an early example of a ray finned fish. Of course, this was all after Tao had made his own recreation of his interpretation in drawing form, which depicts a birdfish hybrid animal with a bird-like head and a fish-like body, carrying itself out of the water via flying with its fin-like wings. Human Intelligence Evolved from Brain-Eating Cults In 1971, writer Oscar Kiss Merth wrote a book called The Beginning Was the End, which describes his pseudoscientific claims that modern humans evolved from cannibalistic apes that fed on brains specifically, which had various side effects like increased sex drive and brain size, but also increased aggression and insanity. This diet of brains apparently suppressed their quote-unquote innate psychic abilities, which is the thing that would slowly cause them to go insane, which leads to where we are now. Anyway, the book was met with a lot of criticism, and is considered to be pseudoscientific because Merth didn't provide any evidence or sources for his claims. According to basic synopses of The Beginning Was The End, he based his claims entirely on alleged conversations with actual cannibal tribes in New Guinea, and him trying raw monkey brains himself in Asia along with a lot of other stuff. But what definitely makes this book even worse is how Merth decided to view race in it. If the summaries and criticisms I've read on it hold true, it boils down to him thinking that non-European and non-Chinese races are not intelligent, he compares ethnic races like Arabs and Africans to apes, he says races shouldn't interbreed due to incompatibility, and possibly the worst one that I heard about is that he believes we should practice racial discrimination because he believes segregating ourselves will lead to world peace. And the list just goes on and on. Just a lot of bad ideas that, uh, according to what I'm hearing, even in the time that he released it, not many people took it seriously. But going back to the brain-eating part, based on the summaries I read on this book, our ancestors did it to increase their intelligence to be smarter than their rivals and increase their sex drive to reproduce more, which would eventually lead to the patriarchal customs that were more common back when this book was released. Merith claimed that eating too many brains would also give our ancestors the side effects of hormonal imbalances, which in turn led to things like masturbation and homosexuality. Man, this book sounds like a wild fucking ride. Dinosaurs were mammals. Immanuel Velikovsky, a controversial Russian-American writer and psychiatrist, had some interesting ideas regarding dinosaurs. But the claim this entry is specifically referencing is one from his article titled Brontosaurus Was a Mammal for the Kronos Journal around 1978. In this article, he says that certain dinosaurs like the Brontosaurus were classified as reptiles even though their structure didn't match the conventional description of a reptile. Reptiles crawl on sprawled out legs, they had narrow pelvises, they laid eggs, and all their teeth looked the same. The Brontosaurus didn't display any of these features, apparently, as it had upright legs, a wide pelvis, and teeth that looked different from each other. Using all of this information, Velikovsky would come to the conclusion that dinosaurs like Brontosaurus were mammals. Mammals walked on upright legs, the enlarged pelvis could be for giving birth to its young instead of laying eggs, and it looked like it had the incisor, grinding, and canine teeth you'd see in mammals. Throughout the article, he refers to the Brontosaurus as a therian which is a group of therapsids and consists of an early group of prehistoric animals that contain the distant ancestors of future mammals. But it wasn't just Brontosaurus that he thought were possibly mammals. He also said certain animals like Diplodocus and Triceratops could also be mammals, but not the same kind of mammal as Brontosaurus, suggesting they probably fell more within the group of monotremes like the platypus, which are mammals that are able to lay eggs. As far as the 
Brontosaurus goes, at the time, Velikovsky pointed out that no discovery of Brontosaur eggs have ever been made, and he ends his segment saying that he doubts there ever will be. Spinosaurus was bombed deliberately. During April of 1944, the original skeleton of the Spinosaurus that was found in 1912 was bombed in Munich, Germany by the British Royal Air Force in World War II. This was and still is considered a massive loss to paleontology for a skeleton of a mysterious dinosaur-like Spinosaurus to be accidental collateral damage in a conflict that didn't involve it. Or was it really collateral damage? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe the target was the Spinosaurus skeleton all along. Maybe it was done on purpose. Apparently there isn't much to this because this is more of an obscure, possibly even comedic conspiracy theory that suggested exactly what the title says. The original Spinosaurus skeleton was bombed on purpose. Why? I have no idea. The Google Doc mentions the initial theory had pointed out it was possibly done due to the Allies having some kind of patriotic drive to destroy the dinosaur to keep their enemies from having the largest theropod dinosaur in their possession, but unfortunately as entertaining as this sounds, there's really not much I could find on it. But Sustained Disgust did tell me that they found it mentioned in a paleo meme group and the slash x slash conspiracy threads. Aside from those places that I don't think were archived, there really isn't any other places that mention it. Gog and Magog were dinosaurs. This is it guys, we did it. We made it to the very last entry on this iceberg. It's been a very long time coming, but we're finally here. Gog and Magog are people, or peoples, that appear in various religious texts, including the Book of Genesis, the Book of Revelations, the Book of Ezekiel, and the Quran. This entry is specifically referencing their depiction in Islamic religious text, where Gog and Magog, also referred to as, I believe, Yajuj and Majuj, are two different groups of people described as a numberless tribe of brutal and ugly creatures that partake in practicing magic and cannibalistic rituals, and they use their practices for committing heinous acts against innocents. These victims of Gog and Magog would seek the help from a prophet by the name of Du al karnain who built a barrier between this group and the Gog and Magog tribe, but warned there would be a time where that barrier would fall in an apocalyptic event that will unleash the dreaded brutes. Despite being described as ugly short humans with large ears, claws, and canines, there are some accounts out there that have described them to look more something akin to that of demonic dinosaurs. The only places that were shown to me by Sustained Disgust were very obscure, very questionable places in regards to their presentation of the theory. This one site claims Gog and Magog are dinosaurs that died out long ago but left behind eggs deep in the pits of Earth that now lay dormant until the time is right for them to hatch. Another place that talks about this theory a little bit more in depth is this essay that manages to make this idea even more wild. According to Ramana Reza, the person who wrote wrote this paper, they believe Gog is an alien dinosaur or dragon from a different planet, while Magog originated here on Earth. Apparently there is a wormhole within Earth that connects to what I'm assuming is supposed to be this other planet that the Gog inhabits. There was a time when both of these hostile nations, as described in the text, had united and attacked China, and the prophet that I mentioned earlier, Du al karnain would guide the people of China to build the Great Wall of China to prevent an attack like this from happening again. To further separate the creatures from each other, a barrier or dam was also built on the other planet to keep the Gog in place and separate from the Magog. But as the tale goes, there will be a day when these walls and barriers will break, and when they do, and these demonic alien dinosaurs and or dragons enter that wormhole again to unite with the dinosaurs here on Earth, chaos and destruction will reign again. But hopefully not before I get this video out. Well, not surprisingly, this was probably the craziest episode that I've done ever in, in this series. Uh, again, that shouldn't be surprising considering this is the bottom of the iceberg. But um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the entire series. That's the entirety of the paleontology fringe theories iceberg. And um, it's, it's been a very wild ride in the last year and a half that <laughs> I have been doing this series. Probably, probably over a year and a half. 
at this point. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't really been keeping track, but I just want to take this time to thank each and every one of you for sticking around with this series and supporting it. Uh, it's, again, like I said in the beginning of this video, the most popular series on this channel. And while it's not 100% done per se in the sense that, like, I'm still going to try to get some corrections out uh, in the form of a very uh, like a, a combined compilation video of the entire series it's gonna double as a corrections video as well but don't expect that for a really long time because i have a lot of plans for what i want to do between now and that hopefully you guys can <laughs> just enjoy the series for what it is now i know it's not again i know it's not a perfect series i know there's a lot of corrections that need to be made and, and clarifications and there's a lot of stuff that I feel like needs to be added as well. I feel like maybe some of them I didn't give nearly as much information as they deserve. So yeah, there's just there's just a lot that I want to do and it's going to take a really long time because I think across the entire board this series is nearing like I want to say maybe like around seven hours total. <laughs> probably more, probably a little less. I'm not sure. I haven't kept track but after this episode it's definitely going to be up there it's it's a long it's going to be very long not to mention i am trying to upgrade my my setup uh i'm not sure if you guys know this but i've been working with a gaming laptop the last few years that i've been doing this so i would like to get a proper pc desktop setup so i'm kind of aiming for that right now i don't know when i'm going to get that but hopefully after i get that i can get started on <laughs> that uh that compilation video for this series a lot of people have actually approached me and asked me uh if they can help me in, in uh putting it together and uploading it as one giant video and uh as much as uh, as much as i appreciate the offers uh genuinely i i feel like this is just something i have to do myself especially since i'm trying to get corrections along with it so it's just there's just a lot to it <laughs> but yeah thank you all so much for everything um I, gen I really did enjoy making this series and your feedback is is <laughs> is not going to be ignored at all I promise I will do my best I will power through it it's going to be hard because there was <laughs> early on there were a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of lot of criticism that was hard to read because uh, it was it was just a lot I think it was just because I was getting it in bulk is because it was harder I'm pretty sure going back on it I'm I'm not gonna really mind as much but again I'm gonna power through it because at the end of the day I do want this series to be something that I can be proud of and even though this final final product is not quite there yet I'm pretty sure by the time I get to that compilation video it'll it'll get there it, it'll be there you know <laughs> but um yeah I just I want to take this time to personally thank Sustained Disgust uh for letting me cover this series and for being for just being helpful uh behind the scenes they did help out uh a bit uh especially in these these uh last couple of episodes for the most part I think I I did find with the google document they provided but obviously as we got lower down to the iceberg and we got to more obscure things it got a little bit harder to research some of this stuff so it was very nice to have their their help so sustained disgust if you're watching this thank you so much just for everything for your help for your co your cooperation for letting me cover this on my channel thank you for everything i appreciate it genuinely but uh yeah i think i think that's pretty much it i don't have much else to say i am very tired i have so much i have a lot to edit still <laughs> at the time that i'm recording this so i don't want to take too much time with this outro so thank you all so much for watching and for sticking with me for this long for the series i hope that my other content will suffice as well <laughs> but um that's all i have to say for now thank you all so much for watching and please have a nice day